Yeah, my name is Samuel Giroux. I'm a PhD student at Purdue University. Um, and today I'm talking about the work that I've done on uh, identifier binding attacks and defenses in software-defined networks. Uh, this is joint work with William Kosh from Boston University, uh, Richard Scavera, Hamed Akravi, and David Bigelow from MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and uh, Christina Naida Rotaru, my advisor from Northeastern University. Uh, so we're going to start by talking about a day in the life of your web browser. Uh, you open up your web browser, um, connect to your wireless network, go to chase.com, for instance, to do your online banking, if you're like me. Um, and when you do that, your web browser issues a DNS request, which is forward on on by your router into the internet. Um, however, supposing there's an attacker uh, in your network, they can observe that DNS request. They can create a forged response pointing chase.com to some random location on your local network. And that response will be accepted by your web browser, which then attempts to connect to that host, issuing an ARC request, um, which, again, the attacker observes and can point, create a forced response pointing to itself, um, which is, again, accepted without question by your web browser, resulting in an HTTP request to the attacker who creates a forged chase.com page um, and is sent to your uh, computer. Once you enter your credentials into that web page, you're pwned. Now, what's interesting about this is that each of these phases that I've just mentioned is a result of insecure identifier bindings. Uh, so what are these identifier bindings, and why are they insecure? Uh, well, to understand that, we need to look a little bit more at uh, the way modern networks are uh, put together with a bunch of protocols that are layered on top of each other. Um, and what's particularly interesting here is that each of these layers has a different identifier for device. So we talk about IP addresses, MAC addresses, host names, and so forth. Uh, the figure on the right here shows uh, the common layers you have in a modern network and the different identifiers for devices that you see at each of those layers. Um, and what's interesting is that these identifiers end up being used not only to forward traffic, uh, but also for access control and authentication uh, in firewalls and so forth. Um, and also that when devices go to actually send network traffic, they need to bind from typically some high layer, you know, uh, DNS name, IP address, down to these low layer MAC addresses and so forth. And to do that, there's a number of different protocols that they're going to use. ARP, DNS, Active Directory, all of these kind of things. Uh, and the problem is that these bindings between these layers end up being performed by insecure protocols that lack authentication at all and that often uh, rely on simple, binding, on simple broadcast queries, rather. Um, so ARP is a classic example, as you see here, where um, ARP binds from an IP address to a MAC address. And the way the protocol works is that if you want to know what MAC address corresponds with an IP address, you send a broadcast request to the whole network and say, hey, who has this IP address? The host answers, I have that IP address. Here's my MAC address. Uh, this, of course, leads to ARP poisoning, as you see in the slide, where attackers can claim to have IP addresses they don't actually have. Um, Additionally, these binding protocols perform no kind of uh, cross-layer checks to ensure that um, low-level identifiers um, aren't, um, that bad low-level identifiers aren't used to change high-layer bindings. Um, and there's also no checks when bindings are updated that the old uh, binding is no longer valid. Um, all of this enables host impersonation, as we just saw a moment ago. It enables man-in-the-middle attacks. It enables privilege escalation by pretending to be some more privileged host in the network. Um, and it enables denial of service by black holing or misrouting traffic. Um, now, of course, there are some existing defenses against these kind of attacks. Uh, port security is a common one that essentially limits the number of MAC addresses that can be present at a given switch port um, in an attempt to prevent uh, MAC address spoofing. But of course, this is you know, a heuristic and ad hoc defense. It's limited only to trying to protect MAC addresses, and it requires manual configuration. Uh, Cisco and others have technology called dynamic ARP inspection uh, to compare ARP responses with DHCP records uh, to try to um, do some filtering there. But um, this provides no protection if you don't use DHCP and is limited only to ARP traffic um, and also requires manual configuration. Uh, similarly, DHCP snooping splits the ports on your switch into a trusted to untrusted zone and filters uh, untrusted zone packets from the trusted DHCP packets. Um, again, if you don't use DHCP, you have no protection that's limited to a single layer and has manual configuration. Finally, DNSSEC prevents forged DNS responses. 
but doesn't prevent rogue servers from existing um is limited only to protecting dns and again requires complex configuration in short existing defenses are ad hoc solutions to protecting specific identifiers and require a manual configuration um now in this work we're not just interested in traditional networks but particularly in how identifier binding changes in software defined networks um and sdn has a number of characteristics that um influence this uh so for instance the unified control plane that sdn provides means that there's typically a single binding table for the entire network so you have a single arc table instead of one in each layer 2 switch a single forwarding table instead of one in each router um sdn also uses very simple uh bare metal switches that don't include any of these existing defenses against binding attacks that we just mentioned um and finally sdns often exhibit this characteristic um called delayed flow rule consistency uh where there are temporary inconsistencies between the controller's forwarding state and the flow rules and the switches uh this tends to result when flow rules are not instantly removed from switches when controller's forwarding state changes um and all of this influences uh, identifier bindings or uh, the attacks that one could perform on these bindings uh so in particular the unified control plane uh means that attackers any oh, anywhere in the network uh can poison any of these bindings you're not just limited to you know poisoning arp on a single layer 2 switch anymore um similarly the uh bare metal simple the simple bare metal switches that sdn uses means that existing defenses need to be implemented at the controller only most controllers have not implemented any of these defenses um and then the delayed flow rule consistency means that attackers can cause a few packets to be forwarded in the network with stale incorrect state um and these may be packets that um are security sensitive for instance uh in short binding attacks have significantly amplified power in sdns now of course um sdn also provides us the ability to develop uh much more powerful defenses here uh so for instance ethane um leverages sdn to provide fine grain access control based on these high level identifiers um to help administrators uh develop policies easily and to do this they're leveraging these bindings for access control at a per flow level but unfortunately ethane is vulnerable to mac address spoofing um and it doesn't protect either the ip address to host name or host name to user bindings uh topper guard is another um existing sdn defense where they first demonstrated an attack um on the mac address to location binding and they developed a defense uh based on checking the old location of the mac address before you allow it to move uh unfortunately they are also vulnerable to spoofing mac addresses and they're only protecting a single binding here uh sphinx identified the same attack uh but developed a different uh defense based on ensuring that new flows are consistent with your existing bindings but they're also they also have the same limitations here they're only looking at this one binding so in short existing sdn defenses only focus on these specific bindings uh leaving all these other bindings vulnerable okay uh so this paper focuses on um two things first we develop a new more powerful binding attack uh the persona hijacking attack that persistently takes over all of the identifiers of a some victim device and will last for hours or days uh and second we develop a defense based on completely preventing all of these identifier bindings a binding attacks which we call secure binder that operates by mediating and validating these bindings and providing a root of trust for network identifiers uh so looking at this attack first uh, a persona hijacking attack um the goal here is to uh take over the victim's ip address and dns name and to uh persist for hours or days the attack operates by first breaking the uh mac address to location then mac address to ip address and possibly the ip address to host name binding um and what's interesting here is that the attacker becomes the owner of record of the victim's ip address so if an attack is to work to be detected here it would actually be the victim that appears to be the malicious party and that appears to be um malicious here um additionally this attack uh co-ops the dhcp server to help propagate the deception further into the network. So if you have devices that depend on the DHCP server for identity information, like audit systems or network visualization things like that, they'll also be deceived by this attack. Uh the attack itself operates in two phases. 
first, there's an ip takeover phase to leverage the dhcp server to steal that ip address and dns name and then the flow poisoning phase that leverages sdn to complete the dhcp assignment. we're going to look at those two phases here in turn first, the ip takeover phase the goal here is to steal the victim's address and co-opt the dhcp server to propagate that deception into the network the way this attack works is that the attacker sends a forged dhcp release message for the victim's ip address to the dhcp server which then releases its address um, the attacker can then send a whole bunch of DHCP discover messages until the DHCP server offers it the victim's old IP address. Uh, now, at this point, once the DHCP server offers an address, it's supposed to check to make sure that nobody else in the network is actually using that address right now. Uh, the way that's typically done is with an ARP flood to uh, go out and request that if, uh, if somebody's using that address, they respond with an ARP reply for that address. Um, we'll look at the details in a moment, but uh, for now, we'll just say that the flow poisoning phase of this attack prevents the victim from responding to that, uh, which means that the attacker is then free to uh, send a DHCP ACK message and complete the DHCP handshake, thereby becoming the owner of the victim's IP address. Um, and with the victim's IP address, the victim has no idea that this is all happening. Um, they also capture the uh, victim's uh, host name as well. OK, uh, so then the flow poisoning phase of the attack, uh, which we glossed over a moment ago, the goal here is to build a black hole that ARP responds from the victim to the DHCP server. Um, and the way this is done is that the attacker sends a spoofed packet, spoofed or multiple packets, that appear to be from the DHCP server and to the victim. These packets will get sent to the SDN controller, which will uh, observe that the DHCP server appears to have moved locations. It appears to now be at the attacker's location. Um, and as a result, it will insert a flow rule into the switch with that information. Uh, now, when the DHCP server then goes to do this uh, ARP flood to check whether the victim is, or the victim's IP address is in use, uh, that packet also gets sent to the SDN controller as a, um, as a broadcast message to broadcast to the whole network, right? Um, and at that point, the SDN controller notices that the DHCP server has moved back to its correct location. However, the problem is that that old rule is not immediately removed. That old incorrect rule is still there. It'll be removed either asynchronously um, or via a timeout at some later point. And what this means is that when the victim responds to that ARP flood, its ARP reply hits that old rule and gets sent to the attacker, which obviously ignores it. Um, this leaves the attacker free to uh, this is the attacker free to um, assign to complete the DHCP handshake with the victim's IP address um, and complete the attack. Um, and the attack will last until the victim attempts to renew its DHCP lease, which is typically on the order of hours or days. Um, so we've tested uh, persona hijacking against both the Onos and Rio SDN controllers um, in a mini net environment. Um, and we found that the attack works um, extremely well against both controllers, um, taking or uh, enabling the attacker to hijack the IP address and a DNS name um, in, for both controllers. Uh, we've also done a source code analysis of the POX and Floodlight controllers uh, that suggests that they are vulnerable, that they don't have any defenses against this kind of attack or actually against any of these identifier binding attacks at all. Um, okay. Uh, so that covers the, uh, our new persona hijacking attack. Uh, we're now going to look at SecureBinder, uh, the defense that we've developed to completely prevent these kind of identifier binding attacks. Um, and when we set out to design SecureBinder, we had a number of, of goals that we wanted to do. Uh, first, we wanted to be able to isolate identifier binding control traffic from the data plane uh, to prevent the attacker from being able to observe and respond to these uh, identifier queries. Uh, so to do that, we're going to uh, mediate all of these bindings and binding control traffic and directly answer these queries and not rely on broadcast. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to, uh, while we still use these insecure uh, identifier binding protocols like ARP, we don't actually have to trust them anymore because they only operate between the network device and the SDN controller. The bindings themselves are actually done by the SDN controller um, and it's um, in, a, in a secure way. Um, 
a second goal that we wanted to achieve was to be able to validate changes to existing bindings. so we wanted to prevent attackers from poisoning these mappings and impersonating other hosts. and to do this, we can leverage a global view of the network to detect and resolve conflicts between these identifiers. a third, we wanted to validate binding control traffic. so we wanted to ensure that low-level identifiers are valid before we go processing the binding control traffic to change other identifiers to prevent attackers from using forged low-level identifiers like forged mac addresses to change you know an ip address mapping or things of that nature. and then finally we wanted to protect readily changed root identifiers so in this case mac addresses preventing attackers from impersonating known but currently unavailable devices. now the first three of these goals we can achieve by leveraging sdn in particular sdn separation of the control plane and the data plane enables us to send this binding control traffic to the control plane isolating it from the other hosts that may be malicious on the data plane and there we can seamlessly interpose on all of these binding protocols and requests in a binding mediator this includes arp, dhcp, dns, netbios, active directory a whole bunch of others and one of the really nice things that this does is it just eliminates the broadcast character of these requests so while the traffic will go from the device to the controller the controller knows all these bindings and never actually has to broadcast out to the rest of the network to find the answer to these these bindings second, sdn's global view of the network means that we can validate these bindings both to ensure that the identifiers are unique and that they're at their expected locations and that all layers of these binding control packets are in fact valid sdn also lets us efficiently prevent all spoofed traffic in the network by using per port egress or outbound filters. egress filters are a common way to prevent spoof traffic but they're typically done at a very very coarse level and they require a lot of administrator involvement. because sdn allows us to programmatically control the network we can do this at a very fine grain level and we can do it painlessly for administrators. okay so the final thing that we wanted from secure binder was we wanted to protect mac addresses and the reason we need to do that is that mac addresses are easily modified. attackers can trivially clone the mac address of victim devices this is typically a one line command on most operating systems and then the network's not able to tell the difference between your legitimate device and the cloned mac address and this is important because mac addresses are often equated with particular devices so we didn't tend to talk about for instance the ceo's laptop my desktop computer the git server based on their mac address and this commonly ends up being used in or for access control possibly indirectly through say you know a static dhcp lease and an ip address and what's important here is that the global view of the network doesn't help us here a global view ensure can ensure that a mac address is at exactly one point in the network but it cannot ensure that it corresponds to the device we expect it to so we need some form of root of trust here to tie the mac address to something that we can't easily spoof um, it's also important to point out that while we don't actually need to protect mac addresses to prevent persona hijacking or art poisoning um, we do need it to completely prevent identifier binding attacks which is the goal that we set out for secure binder the solution that we came up with is to leverage IEEE 802.1x 802.1x provides a cryptographic assurance that a host is authorized to access the network and we extend that to also ensure that it has the MAC address we expect it to 802.1x operates by having a daemon that sits on each of your devices and when you first connect that to a network port the network port essentially only proxies specific authentication messages between that daemon and the radius server and the radius server and the daemon negotiate authentication if the device is successfully authorized then the network port is opened up and can have access to the rest of the network 802.1x supports a variety of authentication mechanisms including both certificate and password based mechanisms and is supported by all major operating systems and switches it's basically the same technology as WPA2 enterprise Wi-Fi if you're familiar with that okay so we did implement secure binder to do this efficiently we leveraged OpenFlow 1.3's multiple flow tables where table 0 does our binding control traffic separation and egress filtering 
on table one and above are forwarding, access control, all of those standard things. Uh, we based Secure Binder on the Onos SDN controller and developed a new uh, binding security app for that that uh, mediates, uh, validates, and maintains all of this binding information. And then we modified their 802.1x app to do this extra MAC address uh, validation check. Um, we evaluated Secure Binder both for security and performance. Uh, for security, we did both a formal evaluation uh, and experimental. Uh, our formal evaluation modeled the key elements of the ARP and DHCP protocols. Um, and then we identified seven correctness invariants that should hold over all of these um, identifiers in any network. And then we used model checking with spin to check this. Uh, we found six attacks without secure binder here. These correspond to known attacks or to our persona hijacking attack. Uh, we then redid this analysis with uh, a model of secure binder um, and found no additional attack, no, found no attacks there. Um, for more information on uh, this analysis and its limitations, I encourage you to check out our paper. Uh, our experimental evaluation was done um, using an emulated SDN uh, environment provided by Mininet. Um, and here we launched three identifier binding attacks uh, used against both Onos and Secure Binder. Um, Onos was vulnerable to all three, and this included our persona hijacking attack. Um, and uh, Secure Binder both identified and uh, blocked all three of these attacks. Uh, for performance, we looked at both the additional latency uh, that Secure Binder imposes on flows, as well as the um, additional packet processing load required. Uh, for latency, we found that Secure Binder introduces an additional three seconds to the host join latency, or the time from when you first connect a host to the network to the time when the network becomes operational. Uh, we think that that's a fairly reasonable uh, overhead given that you know, this is a one-time operation the very first point you connect the system to the network. Uh, we also investigated new flow latency, or the time required to start a new flow. Um, and found no statistically significant difference there between Onos and Secure Binder. Um, finally, we looked at um, controller packet processing load here by measuring the number of packets that were sent to the SDN controller. Uh, we find that Secure Binder um, has a 47% increase over Onos there, which is fairly significant. Uh, but most of these additional packets are uh, 802.1x uh, authentication messages. So there, again, only occur um, the first time you connect a device to the network. Um, as a final part of evaluation, we looked at the number of flow rules required by Secure Binder uh, because these are a limited resource um, in these switches with a typical switch having between about two and 8,000 slots for these rules. Um, as you can see from the uh, figure there, a 48-port edge switch with 2,000 rules will require about a third of its rules to be de dedicated to Secure Binder. Uh, fortunately, for core switches, that number is very much less. Uh, the other important thing to point out is that um, the number of flow rules required in any given switch is a function only of the number of switch ports on that switch and not of the total number of ports in the network. Um, so in conclusion, then, uh, we've demonstrated the power of these identifier binding attacks in SDN by developing a new attack called persona hijacking that breaks multiple of these bindings to hijack the victim's IP address and host name persistently um, and co-ops the network infrastructure to propagate that. Uh, we've, and we've shown this attack is effective against Onos and Ryu. Uh, we then developed a defense called Secure Binder to completely prevent these identifier binding attacks um, by leveraging the global view of the network provided by SDN and a root of trust provided by 802.1x. And we showed that this defense is effective against three identifier binding attacks including persona hijacking, and that its performance overhead is acceptable. Um, and with that, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take your questions now. If you have questions, please come to the microphone over here. Uh, question from the audience? Still trying to wake up? <laughs> okay, I have, I have a question for you. Mm. So um, you rely on some existing technology like yes. 802.1x and so forth, but you have changed um, the, the, the behavior of the controller from the honors and the review. What was the, uh, the most important aspect 
that, uh, I mean, my guess would be the broadcasting situation, but what are the key components that were a change between ONOS and Secure Binding that actually made the difference more than yeah. anything else? Yeah, I mean, so, so the key components is um, a very high priority processing app that grabs all of this identifier binding traffic and uh, validates it before it gets to anybody else. And that's, that's where you're doing the uh, filtering to prevent ARP, ARP poisoning or uh, filtering to make sure that uh, DNS traffic is um, coming from where it's supposed to be, filtering on DHCP packets, all of that. That's probably the most important thing there. Um, and then tying that, integrating that then with 802.1x is the other big component. And so, so your, your, your module intercept the ARP request for a broadcast and does not allow a broadcast. Yeah, so, so we, um, when we get an ARP broadcast, we're going to ensure that um, the, the binding that we're, we're, we're claiming where this, this MAC address is, that you know, there's not, it's not also simultaneously at some other location in the network, for instance, and things like that. Right. I, I have other questions. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Abdul from Carleton University. Um, so uh, with the evaluation done on uh, Mininet, do you see any um, uh, differences? Because as far as I understand, most of these attacks r depend on the moments of inconsistency between the actual network status and the controller view. So do you see any differences or expect differences if we evaluated that on a real network, like attacks being even easier or, or harder? Or um, so I, I don't think you'll see significant differences there because the um, it, it's not a function of the the uh, delay of getting those flow rules updated is not a function of the switches, it's the controller. So Rio, for instance, um, inserts a static timeout on all of these flow rules of a couple seconds, I think. Um, and it, when, when um, that forwarding state changes, it doesn't only try to fix it. It just knows that the flow rules will time out in a couple seconds, and then you'll be OK. Um, so Rio, in particular, is, you know, has such a long um, period of incorrectness that I don't think a real switch will matter there. Um, Onos is a little bit better in the sense that it has a, a second thread that goes around and will catch some of that. In, some of that. Yeah. Hello, Manuel Egele, Boston University. Very nice talk, thank you. Uh, so I was wondering with the, the model checking approach that you had where you mentioned we identified seven uh, invariants. Mm -hmm. Do we know that there is seven and no more than seven and therefore your conclusions that all those attacks are prevented hold? No, no, there are, um, it's, it's not a, a perfect evaluation in that sense. We, found, we identified seven that we believe are, um, are good for the subset that we were actually modeling, but um, it, is, it is not, necessarily complete, um, and model checking in itself is, is not complete in the sense that um, there may be things that we've missed. So uh, we check networks up to, I think, size like 20 hosts. And while you can argue that that will generalize arbitrarily in order to have a completely formal, about, formal uh, proof of that, you need to actually prove that that will extend arbitrarily, and we have not done that. No. Right. 